Hi everyone, it's Dr. Tofi. We're here on another Tuesday at Hernia Talk. Welcome to my Hernia Talk Live. My name is Sharin Tofi. I'm your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Many of you are joining me on Facebook as a live at Dr. Tofi. Thanks for those that are also following me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. And at the end of the show, I'll make sure that this is a, uh, available for you to watch, like, and share on YouTube. So I'm super excited because I get to introduce to you one of my favorite plastic surgeons, Dr. Kevin Brunner. He is board certified, practices in Beverly Hills, I believe. Across the street from me. Across the street from me, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, can, <laughs> you can follow him on Facebook at Kevin, at Kevin A. Brenner, MD, uh, and on Instagram and Twitter at Kevin Brenner, MD. So <laughs> welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Nice yeah, what? This is fun. This is not my usual Tuesday afternoon, so I'm excited. It is my usual Tuesday afternoon, so. <laughs> um, so he's across the street, not because, uh, not because he's special, but I would say that I'm special to be so close to you in practice. But we practice in this like golden, golden triangle, is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, look, yeah, it's kind of like an exclusive. Between Santa Monica and Wilshire Boulevard and I guess Rodeo. Rodeo Drive, yeah, a lot of plastic surgeons. Uh, a, lot most of, them... a lot of plastic surgeons, not only in the triangle, but like on the floor of my building and upstairs and downstairs and across yes. the in your building. <laughs> yes, and my building too. <laughs> so, uh, but, you're here because most plastic surgeons do not do what you do. And today's topic is really on how my audience and I can learn from you and your practice. Because as a plastic surgeon, you're trained to do all different types of aesthetic, cosmetic type surgeries and reconstructive surgery. True. Um, you're board certified in that. You do extra training in addition. You did, your, you did full general surgery training. Is that right? I did, uh, yeah, I did five years of general surgery. Uh, I did, and boarded in general surgery. I did a year of tissue engineering research at UC Irvine, and then three additional years of separate, separate, distinct plastic surgery residency. Wow, so, you, look, you look great for all my, that. My math's not good, but it's nine years of residency. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, that's, it's intense. I, uh, plastic surgeons don't get enough props for the amount of training and education they have to do for... I don't think people appreciate that as much. So part of what you do is augment breasts. And part of that is to use implants for that. Same way that I fix the hernias and a lot of the times we need to use mesh for that. So I remember back in the day, there was this controversy of breast implants causing fibromyalgia. And there was whole Dow cor Corning, right? Like FDA yeah. was like, maybe we should stop making silicone breast implants. And they did for a period of time. Well, so first of all, I we use um, breast implants for reconstruction and, and for uh, <clears throat> cos uh, cosmetic purposes, augmentation, et cetera. And also for what I call cosmetic reconstruction, which uh -huh. we can talk about later. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, you know, a, a lot, a lot of what we do as plastic surgeons is to try to, to avoid using any type of implant and just use your own soft tissue. That's, that's kind of the reconstructive portion of it, but there are times when that's not possible. I mean, not, not everyone is a candidate, uh, like, a, a, let's say breast cancer patient, not everyone is a candidate for a soft tissue repair for various reasons. They just don't have that much soft tissue, for example. They don't have enough tissue. They don't want the morbidity of losing their latissimus muscle. They don't have enough tissue in their abdomen for a transplant. I mean, they don't have access to a microsurgeon. I mean, that's another reason. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, when we were training, we learned both. I actually trained in a very microsurgery heavy program down at UC Irvine, uh, just about every, I, I don't think I did maybe a handful of implant-based reconstructions when I was there. We did a lot of cosmetic surgery, but not a lot of implant-based reconstructions just because we right. had so many free flaps, uh, microsurgery. But, but I mean, implant-based reconstruction, there's, there's definitely a place for it. It's, it's, um, 
you know, widespread around the country. A lot of plastic surgeons do it. It's not something, it's not, it's not even something that I kind of went into practice to do. That's not, that's sort of not my, that wasn't my focus. I was more of like a mommy makeover, breast reconstruction, breast lift revision. And my practice just sort of very quickly developed into a, uh, pr not exclusively, I do everything, but like a big chunk of it is revision breast work. Right. So that, that's implant complications breast, you know, lift complications, reduction. I just did a re redo reduction complication today. So the, um, the you know, kind of the breadth of what we do is pretty significant. Um, but but I also realized that there were a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of implant complications and, I, and, and uh, that, I mean, that can happen. A lot of times that people do great with them and have amazing results, but there are, yeah. and apart, apart from breast implant ones, there are a lot of different things that can and do happen with, with breast implants. Rupture, capsular contracture, uh, malposition where it's not in the right place, rippling, uh, you know, every, everyone's breast is different. Um, but as my practice sort of developed, I started seeing people trickling in saying, my, my implants are making me sick, mm -hmm. which, I thought, which I thought was very strange. I was like, you know, their exam's normal, the implant's soft, if the implant's soft, then they probably don't have a, a capsular contracture. And, um, but they weren't complaining of the breast. They were complaining of their whole body, right? Well, we can, we'll get into that. There, yeah, there's about 40 plus different symptoms, symptoms that people have uh, complained or associated with. It. And, um, the, uh, sorry, um, the, the thing is, they, they, I, I initially, I, I thought the patient, I, I thought it didn't make any sense, but I have a big cosmetic practice and I think, and I said to myself, if someone can come in and request that I put in a breast implant, they should be able to come in and request that I take one out. That's and, very open-minded. Right. So if, if that means- We don't think that way. <laughs> what's that? Most mesh surgeons don't believe that. They don't believe that if- in fact, they feel they know how to put it in, but they can't take it out or it can't be taken out or it shouldn't. Uh, they, right. There's a lot of resistance towards it for me. Because, because with a, a hernia repair, just like with a, a breast implant, when, you know, the, the anatomy changes just by virtue of you putting it in. Right. And so when you take it out, you, you now are left with a deficit, whether it's... Yeah relative or real there's a there's a soft tissue deficit yeah. that needs to somehow be filled and whether you know for a hernia that's a soft that's a kind of a soft tissue repair for right. breast uh, for a breast implant that can be a breast lift that could be a uh, fat grafting that could be a very a multitude of different things or, or nothing at all so what i recall is that and I forget what year it was. I was much younger. I may have been in college or, or maybe medical school where this whole like breast implants were making people sick. It was taken, the silicone implants were taken off, FDA stopped. And the whole thought was either these women are crazy. There's no such thing. That was really the, 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 the talking point. And then they said, well, maybe it's the silicone. So let's make breast implants without silicone or encapsulated. So it's like two layers of Tissue of implant before this, there's silicone. So even if there's a leak of silicone, the body won't see it. And so now breast implants came back with like saline and, and other sorts of kind of hybrid type breast implants. But I feel that over time, maybe even that's been debunked. It's not really necessarily a silicone issue, right? right. And now you've named it. It's called breast implant illness or BII. Well, I don't know who they are. Well, not you, but no, I'm just saying, like they it's are. The name. I don't know if they are patients or they are patient advocates. They are probably not plastic surgeons who came up with that term. Yes, uh, I, I don't know because I sort of it, it just sort of has you know landed in our in, our, in my lap kind of thing. Yes, I, I didn't we didn't I didn't create this, um, but you're absolutely right about the breast implants. I mean. So, you know, breast, breast implants go back to 70s and 80s. And initially, the only the first implants were, were silicone implants. Mm -hmm. 
they were very different in terms of how they were made. The, sh the shell integrity was different. The, the cross-linking of the silicone in internally within the, the gel itself was different. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right that what happened was it, similar to this, although in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, there was no social media, right? So, right. Um, so the ability for patients to communicate with one another share their stories and be vocal about it was was much less and a lot of these patients you know i mean i like you was in college at the time high school and college and you know, <laughs> training when most of this was going on so I, I i was kind of peripherally aware of it but it wasn't it was never front of mind and and there was a point at where they started describing very similar systemic type of symptoms, which they called um, silicone syndrome. Right? And, mm. and the, the thought was that that it was the silicone in the breast implants that was either as a result of, of a rupture or leakage of an implant that it was getting into the bloodstream and causing these systemic symptoms. Right. Um, or um, just like what we, you know, bleeding through an implant, even if it wasn't ruptured, what we call gel bleed. And just the exposure to the silicone was, silicone was causing various symptoms. Now, you know, it's, it, so, so that, that did in fact happen. The FDA did impose a moratorium on silicone implants for cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. And basically they were only available to us in breast reconstruction for a period of time. And oh, then so it, cancer patients, yeah. You cancer know. patients and uh, I mean there are other types of reconstruction that we were able to use it for tuberous breast you know uh, other developmental deformities mm -hmm. uh, fail and, and also failure of saline implants and what what that means is sort of you know not well defined um, but it, it wasn't up, up until 2006 when the, the big implants at the time the big implant companies at the time which were mentor and allergan yeah re-engineered their silicone implants and with the FDA were able to get conditional approval for cosmetic surgery that we started using them again which was basically right when I finished like right when I went into private practice out of training which was in 2006 I you know a few months later we boom I hadn't been using silicone implants for breast augmentation and suddenly I was able to so that so most of my career has been in in the zone of, of silicone implants and is that the most common cosmetic operation that's performed? Is it breast? Breast augmentation specifically. Yeah. There's about okay. give or take 300,000 breast augmentations every year, breast oh. augmentation, and just over 100,000 breast reconstructions with implants. Wow. There's a lot of patients out there. Um, so, but, but what happened was they, when they, when they reapproved the implants in 2006, they, they, the FDA did mandate what was called a post-approval study. Yes. In, in so much as whatever patient was, was to get an implant, they had to be kind of enrolled by the, not by the plastic surgeons, but by the implant companies. They had to have a certain degree of follow-up, if you will, uh, in terms of, symptom development, any problems, complications, et cetera. Now that that was the um, that was the the writing. That was that was those were the directions. In in reality where the rubber meets the road, it, I don't know that it ne that necessarily happened. Hmm. And the reason why I don't think that necessarily happened is because both Allergan and Mentor a few years ago, which are two of four breast implant companies and two, and two of the, uh, only three of the four make silicone implants, but but they were both sort of I don't know if they were officially sanctioned, but it was determined that they their their um, follow up on this data was so low that it didn't even make sense. So um, that's so. what's going on with mesh in that. Uh, so pelvic mesh has been has been. Uh, I don't know if there, there may be one company that still sells pelvic mesh, but that's kind of off. In the like, U.S., there's no yeah. state, there's no phase four, which is post-marking surveillance for hernia mesh. But in Europe, in the European Union, the European Commission has mandated that they just can't figure out who should do it 
and how to make sure that it's done. That's the problem, which sounds like in the US for breasts, they had the companies do it, but then you're having people, companies self-regulate themselves and that doesn't work. Right. Yeah. I would imagine that. So yeah, I mean, this all, uh, well, I mean, it all comes, it, at the end of the day, for the companies, it all comes down to dollars and cents in terms of- Correct, yeah. <laughs> You know, they can't, if they can't, if we can't use mesh, if we can't use breast implants, the companies can't make them and they can't make money off of them. And that, that probably sounds awful to most patients, but it's, it's just the it's simple, business, yeah. just the simple reality of business in our, in this country. So, um, and, you know, and, and which, you know, which is this same critique I hear for, for surgeons like, oh, well, you're only putting in breast implants because you're making money off of it, or you're only fixing hernias because you're making money off of it, or yeah. know, this person has a deal with Allergan, this person has a deal with Mentor, this person has a deal with Sanford, they're getting paid, paid endorsements, so of course they're going to keep I, by the way, have no financial uh, interest in any of these companies. Yeah, same. Uh, which is not the reason that I do this. The reason that I do this is because I really think that um, there are some people, a lot of people who are suffering from it and, 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 I, and I've physically seen them get better. So we have some questions turned in to try to help figure this out. And you're the expert. There are very few plastic surgeons. Actually, let me, let me discuss that. There's very few plastic surgeons that do what you do, which is see, treat, evaluate women with potential breast implant illness. Um, the same way I'm one of very few hernia surgeons or general surgeons that uh, treats or addresses what I, I've been calling mesh reaction, but maybe we should be calling it mesh implant illness um, just to keep it all <laughs> the same family because I think it is. Uh, but we were discussing this before, before the hour started. Uh, we're in the minority. You're in the minority. Your colleagues do not all agree that there is such a thing as um, breast implant illness or needs to be treated, yeah. stuff, right? Uh, that's tr that's probably absolutely true. Yeah. I, now, I'm not the only one that does this. Correct. That's very clear. I mean, there are uh, probably a handful of other people, surgeons that I'm aware of in Southern California, the LA area that, that, that do it. I do a a huge volume of it now so right that's a little different i mean i i now i do have i i this is uh there's this will probably take more than an hour but i do i do have created kind of uh, a breast team in my practice because surgery is only a, a small component of it so i have other practitioners who, who, who do other ish things and we can kind of get into what, yeah what those are all about whether or not you know they're valid in work or whatnot, um, but but I think I'm the only, I'm definitely the only one that has kind of a breast team that's like this that that's kind of man kind of managing globally all the right. things that can potentially happen or most of them. Um, so perhaps you can just define for us what is breast implant illness. So uh, as in, in 2021. My, my understanding of breast, Ill, breast implant illness is that it's a constellation of symptoms that patients get that they attribute to having a breast implant placed in their breast. So okay. um, no two patients are identical, number one, right? Symptoms vary. I, I now have a, uh, an intake symptom list where I have patients kind of rank what symptoms they have, the severity of the symptoms, so that I, I know what it is when I meet them for their consultation. I know yeah. what a week, a month, three months, six months, one year post-op, so that I can actually have something tangible to hold on to, because there really is nothing tangible about breast implant illness at all. Yes. It, it's completely subjective, right? It's, it, it's all in the patient's mind and experience in terms of what they're going through, what symptoms they're having. Now, that's that's part of it. The other thing is that they're, they're because the most of the symptoms are symptoms 
that you and I learned in medical school and in residency are attributed or attributable to other disease processes, other legitimate disease processes, right? Yeah. That are often serious or can be serious if left untreated. There, there's a lot of crossover. And so to the objective physician, whatever the specialty is, to, to look at someone who is like, who comes in and says, oh my God, I'm tired all the time. I yeah. can't I have brain fog, I can't think. I, I have like shooting pain down my arm. I, I have muscle aches in my legs. I'm losing more hair than ever in my life. By the way, I'm 30 years old. I can't get I can't get out of bed. And I and and oh, I was fine before I had my breast implants, and this started like a year or two after I had my breast implants. So right. is it related? So this is what I'm dealing with every week. Yes. In terms of patient experience. And you know, back in the before breast BII was a thing. A lot of a lot of patients like that would get chalked up to having fibromyalgia, which which right. which when we were in medical school was sort of like a like a, a waste bin diagnosis. Like yeah, you know, non-diagnosis. Rule, yeah, you, you rule out everything else, and if you can't figure out what is causing their symptoms, it must be fib- must be fibromyalgia, right? So, so you have your own survey, or is there like a nationally acceptable survey for this? There's. I, I, there may be a nationally acceptable acceptable survey. I, what I was going to say is I have, we, we've been doing periodic phone calls um, with part of my breast team, but with other surgeons around the country who do yeah. do a lot of, um, as, as do, as do I. And the, the, I actually, the survey I have is a modification of one that I got from another surgeon who I believe is in Chicago if I recall correctly, but yeah. The symptoms but- sound similar to what I see. So it's, and it's, it's not all of it. It's like pick bits and pieces, but it can be everything. I'll go from head to like hair loss, headache, um, brain fog, uh, inability to concentrate, memory loss, double vision, ringing in the ear, um, uh, v- chronic fatigue, joint pains, joint swellings, arm and leg swellings, weird, weird shooting pains in the arms and legs. Um, bloating? Do your patients get bloating? Nausea? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know about bloating per se, but I, I have some patients who are, who have unexplained weight gain. I have others that have oh. unexplained weight loss. Yes. Some patients with Hashimoto's. I have some patients who are yes. Um, I, and, and we didn't even talk about autoimmune phenomenon, which is yes. sort of. Um, the big thing, I, I, I don't know if it's as big a thing with uh, hernias as it, with, with hernia mesh as it is with, or it has been with implants. I mean, the whole thing about uh, the moratorium on, on silicone breast implants was that a, a, a large number of women were claiming that they had developed autoimmune phenomena yeah. as a result of their implants. Now, Same. people get autoimmune phenomena, no doubt. Yeah who don't have breast implants. So it, you know, there are, Sjogren's syndrome is a thing. Hashimoto's is a thing. Scleroderma is, I mean, these are all real diagnoses that people get who don't have breast implants. Correct. So, Rheumatoid so arthritis. I even have a patient with uh, vitiligo, which is an autoimmune disorder. Um, so, but let me ask you this. So uh, I remember there was an article early on, this is during the, the first wave of before the FDA just um, put a moratorium, there was an article that said, we're gonna look at the whole population and see how many people tend to get all these autoimmune disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, uh, Hashimoto's, ulcerative colitis, et cetera. And then look at all the breast implant patients, see how many of them get autoimmune. And they said it was exactly the same. And therefore there's no, higher risk with breast. But now within the past, I think four or five years, there was an article that says, no, actually there is a slightly higher risk of autoimmune disorders among patients that have breast implant illness. So it's all evolving. We're learning with time, it seems. It's funny. So it just in preparation for 
this hour, I actually went back and reviewed a lot, a lot of papers that I've read before, um, as well as some new ones. I mean, mm -hmm. when I started a couple of years ago, I, you know, I had a piece on KTLA and I, and I said, we don't have any data, there's no studies. And that was true at the time. Now that's not true. I mean, there have been a handful of studies in the last few years. Yes. Whether you agree with the statistical analysis on them or not, they're there. I mean, they, they've been published, okay? And not yeah. every article that's published is necessarily, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily make it the gospel just because it's published. There are people that, you know, debate it back and forth. But the very fact that people are publishing about it means that there is definitely uh, a, a trend and a, de a build. And when I was at, uh, I attended, albeit virtually, our, our um, society's spring meet. Mm -hmm. It was the, uh, just this past spring, it was the first time that I actually saw a, sort of a change, a change in the tide in terms of people talking about it studies being done by our societies by I used by our educational foundation and and maybe not everyone was on board i'm sure a lot of people weren't on board but they were they were discussing it whereas prior to that it was like That's pop true. Up, i don't even want to touch it like That's the true. landmine so you know right before kind of the whole covid shutdown we had um uh, I went to, I think it was a Cedar sinai plastic surgery meeting and started and was giving a presentation about, about my experience with breast implant illness. And, and, I, and, you know, it's a group of just local plastic surgeons. And I thought I was going to have tomatoes thrown at me because, you know, I think I'm a quack. But, but the reality is, is that I'm not a quack. And, you know, I'm as legitimate a plastic surgeon as any other plastic surgeon in, in this country. And... And I just happen to believe my patients that they're feeling this because yes. they because they um, they definitely feel better. I I think that's a very strong statement where you believe your patients. First of all, these patients aren't all gathering together and coming up with the same exact story. Like that's not what's happening, and yet they're coming. Uh, there seems to be a similar story, and we just don't know enough as physicians. I feel like physicians are very uncomfortable when they don't know. So it's very easy to say it doesn't happen or it doesn't occur, and, right? And so if you just listen to the patients and admit that you don't know and you're learning, and unfortunately we're in this stage right now where we don't know enough and there are patients that need our help and we kind of think we know what we're trying to do to help them, but there's no science behind a lot of what we do because uh, we're in the, the, the learning stages of it. And, uh, yeah, I feel like, yeah, I mean, they probably think I'm a quack too because I do treat patients with potential mesh reactions. Let me ask you this. So in my experience, the mesh reaction patients react within days, weeks, months, maybe a year or two, but really not a lot after that. Is that your experience too? It's kind of early. They don't come 10 years later with a problem. No. Okay. No, I mean, now mind you, the patients that I'm seeing I, you know, I, I look back at this, I, I've only had, I mean, I, you know, I, I've done a lot of breast implant surgery, primary revision, just in, in the last 15 years. Yes. I've only had one patient of my own come to me requesting to be explanted because she thought that she had BII. She also thought, by the way, she had ALCL, which is a, a rare, very rare lymphoma that's been associated with some textured Yes, varieties of implants. Two two separate entities, but the you know the, uh, the question is: Is there any commonality to it? Is there right. any some sort of unifying theme? Um, I, so most of my most of the people that I see, it, you know, it's a delayed phenomenon. Now, sometimes that delayed phenomenon is six months. Sometimes it's a year, and and sometimes it's twenty years. Oh. and and. Um, and this will come out when I crunch the numbers on the patients, but I, it, it seems to it seems to be, and I don't have data on this, so don't don't hold my my feet to the fire on this. But it seems to be that 
some of the newer generation of implants have a have, seem to have a quicker uh, time to development of symptoms than older patients. I mean, I, I have patients who've had yes. 30 years with no problems. Correct. You know, saline implants, no problems. Um, that's that's one thing. The, the other thing is, is that I don't think this is, we, you touched on it before and we got sidetracked, but I don't think this is a silicone phenomenon, even though in fact, prior to the moratorium, it, it, people were thinking that it was a silicone phenomenon. Yeah, that's what they were blaming, yeah, right. And, and the reason is, is that, the reason I say that is, I see a lot of patients with saline implants that have the same symptoms. And while the shell of the, of the silicone implant and the shell of the silico, uh, of a saline implant are the same, it's a solid silicone elastomer, right? Mm -hmm. so it's, not, it's not like the shell is dissolving. Some, some people think that, well, there's tons of different chemicals, including right. you know, heavy metals like platinum that are used to, mm. to make the shell and that perhaps that's leaching and I don't I don't I'm not familiar with the biochemistry behind hernia mesh but like perhaps that's the whatever's making the the implant is leaching into the body and causing these toxicities yeah. and causing these symptoms I don't necessarily ascribe to that I mean I'll I will admit it as soon as I as, as soon as I see evidence to the contrary um, but I, what I what I think is is that it's 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 just an immune immunologic response to having a foreign body and do you see that that's increasing? Do you see like we're seeing more of this problem? Like it's like a, becoming more of a problem, not because we're seeing it more, but there's actually more cases of it? Like, is there an increasing incidence of it? Yes. Um, I, I probably not. Okay. It's probably not that the numbers are changing. I yeah. think the, diff the biggest difference is A, social media, everyone's talking about it together. And so they come, it's, it's almost like they're all, like they come together in groups of people. So it seems like there's more patients than maybe it did 10, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. that, that's one thing. Um, patients are much more vocal about it as a result of that. This is true. I think a lot of patients were um, reticent to say anything. Number one. Number two, when they did when they brought it to the attention of their physician, whether it was their family practitioner, their internist, their cardiologist, their neurologist, rheumatologist, whatever, plastic surgeon, whatever, whoever it was, they were dismissed. Yeah, like, yeah, and, that's true. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've had patients say, you know, I can't believe you're listening to me. I went to my plastic surgeon, I went to my internist. They said, everything's fine, you're crazy, get out of my office. Yeah. Nothing wrong with your implants. All the time. And, and and there may be nothing wrong with their implants, but, yeah. but there's something wrong. And, and what I think it is, is that there's, it's, it's it, some people just have, are kind of pre-wired to have this immunologic response. And immunologic response, you know, everyone's very familiar with immunologic response since COVID, but mm -hmm. like immunologic response happens in more than one way. It's not, it's not just, antibodies it's not just right. bodies right there's t cells there's b cells there's i mean there's all there's a whole cascade of, of cells in our bloodstream that can cause immunologic reaction and it doesn't i think it's just that the, the immune system's going haywire and just sort of kind of willy-nilly hitting different systems that's that's my hypothesis i don't have any proof of that but there are definitely studies that are going on there are, are surgeons and, and by the way, I kind of noticed that a lot of the studies that I've seen, even though there's a handful in the US, there was a very good study recently out of uh, the Philadelphia area. There's one out of, from a surgeon in Ohio, which, which are you know start, starting to kind of show that the benefits of removing implants, et cetera. But a lot of the studies I've seen are outside of the country, primarily in Australia. Really? They do a lot, of, a lot of breast implants in Australia, so there's a lot of data to go out to go after. Yeah, so I see similar population. They're told it's in their head, uh, psychological problems with their anxiety. Um, if it's a female, which it often is, they are asked, you know, are you having okay sexual relations? How's your relationship with your husband? Like there's a lot of that going on, um, which is very disparaging. And then they lose hope. Uh, 
because no one's listening to them and and they they legit have i mean i have patients that have rashes do you have patients with rashes do they see do you see uh, rashes sometimes, yeah. yeah i mean you can't make up a rash <laughs> and you can go through a whole dermatologic workup which they all do and uh, then at some point you have to kind of figure things out now i have a question for you so you mentioned in your plastic society this year you start to see that there's like a little upswing of interest in breast implant illness and, and studying it. We just had, had one of our meetings this past week and then also two weeks prior to that. Also very noticeable industry and surgeons are both talking about less synthetic mesh, more tissue repairs, removing of mesh. And also uh, there's a new interest by industry to bring in what's called absorbable meshes. So things that kind of come and go. I have a question for you on that because it's, it's posed here by one of our viewers. So one of the absorbable meshes is called Phasix. It's P4HB, I think is the chemical name for it. It's also sold as Galaflex uh, for breast. So when I saw surgeons on social media putting Galaflex in for every single breast they were doing, uh, I freaked out because I'm like, why are you doing that? It's like a highly inflammatory potential. Um, we weren't doing that before. And, and they claim they have had no issues. And yet I've had people with phasix mesh, which is the Galaflex equivalent, but on the hernia side, who have reacted to the, the implant. Because well, that's, uh, that's how anything that's absorbable, that's how it absorbs is, is inflammation. So... <laughs> So do you see people with Galaflex coming to you with problems? Have you seen Galaflex problems? Just curious. No, but, but I also don't, I don't like, I, I, I will use mesh and breast surgery. Yeah. The mesh that I prefer is, is a cellular dermal matrix. Yes. A variety of other, I'm not. I, Me too. I, yeah. yeah. I, I have no financial interest. I just, I, I, I like Alliter because I've been using it for so long. Um, yes. So when I need it, I mean, it's, it's ridiculously expensive, uh, especially since they took the, they, they used to have a cosmetic component to it. Yes, I remember. A cosmetic arm to it, and there was a lot, it was a lot more affordable. And now it's, it's, it's either that, and it's like an arm and a leg, or you, there is a pig variety called Stratus, which it, all it is, is, you know, acellular uh, matrix. Except it seems to be more processed than, than Aladerm. Don't, don't you think? Stratus? I think Stratus is a little bit more processed. It just seems to act more synthetic and for mesh at least, I don't know. Um, Even though it's biological. Yeah, well, it, it, anyway, my, my point is I, I have used absorbable meshes before. I have, I've used other, there's been a lot of things that have been coming on, the, on and off the market. Yeah. And, I, and I've had bad, I've had, I have had in the breast bad reactions before. And I'm mm. blanking on the name of it was a biologic mesh and I can't think of the name of it at this time, but um, that, it was um, the silk one that like, was taken off the market. Not, no, not silk. No, well, silk, silk's not absorbable. Yeah, it, it, it was marketed as being absorbable by logic. <laughs> I, I remember that. That uh, came and went very quickly. But, but yeah, I, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've gone to meetings before where, where people are talking about using you know, either micro mesh or uh, Galaflex in their breast lifts because they get they think that they get a more permanent lift, more permanent contour. I've never done that. I've never had a need to do that. Um, maybe it helps. I, I don't know. I just I just find it unnecessary. Uh, you know, have you blood blood tests? Yeah. Do you check blood tests or labs? Um, I don't check blood tests or labs necessarily at the, at the time of consultation. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm almost kind of like the, the end stop for a lot of patients. So they, right. most of them have already been to the rheumatologist or their primary care or both or cardiac, whatever the, the spe specialist that they need to go to for whatever symptom they're having. Right. And so a lot of times they'll come in with it. And so I'll review everything. Um, However, before we go, before I put a patient to sleep, yeah, I check kind of routine CBC chemistries. Uh, I, I did this year start checking, in addition to coagulation, I started checking an ESR and CRP, which are mm -hmm. inflammatory markers. 
and thus far I haven't, I don't think I've had one patient where they're elevated. Same. Um, um, but I, but I'm doing it because I was curious. Yeah. I used to, um, I used to, my initial thought when I started seeing this is that, is that much like capsular contracture or ALCL, that perhaps there's an infectious etiology behind it, right? Yeah. Because the one thing, I, which is probably true for hernia mesh as well, is that with, with breast implants, if an implant gets, any implant gets contaminated, like it's contaminated until you yeah. put it an autoclave, which you can't do with a breast implant without ruining its integrity, it's contaminated. You can't, um, it's not like you, you just wash it off with antibiotic ointment or betadine or whatever and decontaminate it because yeah. some of these bacteria create this slime layer that, which sticks to the silicone. And, and it's interesting, a lot of people think that, well, if you know, my breast implant was infected, I would know it because just like a pimple, it would be red, hot, swollen, pus, et cetera. Not the case with breast implants because 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 there's a breast capsule that's around the, the implant, yes. just like there's a capsule around any implant, and and that space is a privileged environment, right? Because mm -hmm. so things can't your your white blood cells can't get in there like they can into your soft tissue. Yeah, we've checked blood tests too, and they've always been normal, even though clearly the patient's eliciting some type of inflammatory or autoimmune reaction, but it's not enough to show, at least on the normal labs that you can order. Now, if there's a research lab that can check HLAs and other kind of fancy stuff, cytokines, maybe that will show, but uh, yeah, we have also not been able to show a difference. I, I mean, I, um, I, I started by swabbing the, every time I took out, did an X-ray, I would swab inside the capsule. Yeah. Inside the the yield was so low that I stopped doing it. I For did, bacteria. Yeah, I mean, I got a, I got a, I think I maybe I got two staff that grew out one propionibacter, you know, which are which are all normal skin flora. Um, it just and then and then patients were getting all these bills for for these microbiology bills from UCLA because they're expensive to run those tests. So it's right. like unless there's yeah. a reason for it. I don't do it. I don't really do it routinely anymore. So I've discussed on Hernia Talk that my practice has changed. In fact, I'm hoping to present this change in my practice uh, at next year's American College of Surgeons Southern California chapter meeting. I hope if our abstract gets accepted to kind of show how over time, because of this kind of experience that we've had with patients reacting to mesh and then looking and seeing how they they kind of tend to be women. They tend to be really thin patients. They tend to be people that already either have an autoimmune disorder or have a family history of it um, or have known to have like breast implant illness already. So I probably will not put a mesh in that person or they've had reactions to dental implants or have shown some propensity towards reacting to implants. Um, do you feel that your practice has also changed? Are you less likely to talk someone into getting a breast augmentation or do you talk them out of it? What's your um, take on that? It, it, it's definitely changed. Your question on the screen is, are, are there subsets of patients that I choose, that I choose not to implant? And the answer to that is probably no. Okay. Because they're all young, thin females. Just, anyway. well, yeah, no, just, they're not all young, thin girls. I mean, it's, I see kind of the full spectrum. The, the reason for, I mean, First of all, I'm doing so many explants that the, the percentage of implants and explants in my practice has changed drastically. Wow. That's number one. Number two wow. is I, I do do some revision surgery and will do removal and replacement, ruptured implant, fixing, you know, what, what, there's various reasons for it. Yes. Um, I, I, I will do breast augmentation, a primary breast augmentation on someone. The, the difference that, that, I, that I have made, the change that I have made, I should say, in my practice is, is my consent process. Mm. And, and whereas it was never on my radar before, now BAI is front and center in my mind all yeah. the time, every day, all day. And so it's part of my consent process. It, That's I mean, amazing. And, and, yeah. and, and my consent process starts during my consult. So, I mean, I, a patient comes in for a breast consult, I usually spend about an hour with them. So, wow. because there's a lot to go over. And part of that, you know, if they want a breast, implant part of that is yeah you can get a capsular contracture depending on which study it's between eight and twenty percent yes you can get malposition yes you can get rippling yes you can get an infection you can you know 
can get a device rupture, it's going to happen at some point. You can't get ALCL if you have a texture device. You mm -hmm. can't get DII with any device. And that's mm -hmm. part of my conversation with them. I mean, we don't have a lot of statistical data to give them. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just my kind of anecdotal experience. And now there are studies that are starting to come out. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, because I think I'm doing a disservice to people to not tell. I mean, I, I think every, any, any plastic surgeon that's putting in a breast implant today, that needs to be part of it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it. You know, people are still going to do it. It's not going to go away completely. It's just, that's just the reality. But, the, but, but a good plastic surgeon will be informing their patients about the, but whatever risks they're aware of. And if a plastic surgeon at this point in time is not aware that breast implant illness is on the horizon right now, yeah. then they they got their head in the sand. Seriously, it, it, yeah. that that's how much noise has been made in the last couple of years. There's a question related to breast implants uh, proposed. Have you seen capsular hemorrhage in breast implant patients as they age, especially those who need anticoagulation for, let's say, atrial fibrillation? Have you seen that? Um, I myself haven't seen it. One of my associates I, I know has seen a patient who had what, like a bloody seroma. Right. And so you, you know, someone presents with a late, what we call a late seroma, which is usually like six months after six months or later after their implantation. In mm -hmm. any seroma at that point in time, you have to we kind you kind of in your back of your mind, you have to rule out a lymphoma, right? Mm -hmm. So so I, I have seen it and you know, usually I'll send them to my radiologist over on Brighton and they'll if there's a seroma, they'll aspirate it. We'll check it before we go to see. You know, I don't want to find about it, find out about it after the fact. I want to know ahead of time. Right. I personally have never seen spontaneous hemorrhage from any coagulants, but um, but that post-op hemorrhage. I mean, that's that's that happens. <laughs> uh, when you're treating patients with BII, what's your experience once you remove the implant? They do they get cured? Does it linger? Is it everyone a little bit different? What about their symptoms? Um, everyone is a little bit different. I, yeah. I, I hesitate to use the word cure because, because I, I, don't, I, don't, I, mean, I, I prefer to say uh, res, res, excuse me, resolution. Pre, resolution of symptoms. Remission? Um, not remission because it's not a cancer. Um, I notice that, you know, I see all my breast patients, I see all our patients, most of them, anyone who has a major procedure, I see the next morning after surgery. I see a difference in these patients. The yes. morning after surgery. They're like a new person. It, the, not everything's gone, but like, I feel like the brain fog has lifted. Yes. I feel like their eyes are brighter. Yeah. More energetic. People, like they're, you're right. They're like more attentive, about, more energetic. A lot of people say like, I don't know if it's the Percocet talking, but I just feel better. Yeah. And, and maybe it is the Percocet talking in the next morning, but I, <laughs> I legitimately think that the patients feel better even, even than starting it the next day. It's not going to be a hundred percent. I have some patients who start feeling better. I have some patients who get, um, you know, a hundred percent resolution of symptoms i have some that just that don't get any i mean that does happen same experience but, but, but then they maybe they didn't have breast implant illness in the first place yeah you'll never know because we don't have any objective data it's really just a, i mean there, there, there really is another, interesting and you'll you'll be interested in this or maybe not since now all you do is hernias but i had a patient um this past year who uh, amongst her other myriad of symptoms uh, had uh unexplained pancreatitis, idiopathic. Okay. Had seen like the top pancreas guy over at Cedars. He didn't know what was causing it because she was, uh, you know, relatively young, I don't know, 40, mm -hmm. otherwise healthy, unexplained pancreatitis, it, ER admissions in and out for abdominal pain, pancreatitis, lipase, you know, in the 200s or whatever. And 
in, in fact, it, like he had, you know, he was, he was, she had her, he had her on medication just to kind of keep it quiescent, never went away completely. She had a, a, a sort of a, a recurrence right before her scheduled surgery. I, I bumped, I pushed her surgery two months just to get it under control because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, have, you know, I don't want to put someone to sleep for a big operation in the middle of the pancreas. Yeah. So she kind of, we kind of calmed her down and eight weeks post-op, her life pace was back to normal. Oh, so was autoimmune pancreatitis potentially? Whoa, that's a big deal. Maybe. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, we'll never know, but I, I don't know. Temporally, it's correlated. 100%. And wow. That's one person. And you can't generalize and extrapolate from one person, but right. but it happened. I mean, I saw that. So, like, I don't, and and I I, I don't. There's a there's a um, an endocrinologist that I, I know around here who who told me that also anecdotally it, he's seen many patients who've been explanted who had Hashimoto's. Yes. And their any thyroid antibodies tapered off to zero after explantation yeah i've talked to many endocrinologists and they're all seeing some some shady stuff going on like you know there's these new like you said hashimoto's thyroiditis or this kind of like lupus like syndromes but it's not really lupus and then you take out their mesh let's say or their breast implant or they send it to me like do you think this is possibly related because these operations are very common. We have a million hernias done a year. You have, what'd you say, 600, 700,000 breast implants? That means that you're going to be busier than I am. Yeah, I am busier than you are. <laughs> <laughs> but I would do, yeah, I, we, I do all yeah, the other yeah, fun yeah. stuff you do. <laughs> yeah, no, there's probably, probably about 400,000 patients who get implants every year. Yeah, it's just crazy. Well, and for breast implants, you know, most of them are relevant. So that's uh, this is true. Double four hundred thousand patients. That's somewhere between six and seven hundred thousand implants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so crazy. I feel like one day we're going to look back. You're going to tell your grandchildren when I was in practice, well, we were putting the stuff in people. We were putting plastic in people. We thought it was okay, and then everyone got sick. I'm just exaggerating, but there's going to be no. Some but looking but back at this, I mean, I mean, you and I had very similar training i mean I, I put mesh in people all the time when i was a general surgery resident yeah didn't even think twice about it i mean unless it got infected from in the intestines yeah that that's what you were you were worried about it ulcerating in the intestine you didn't worry about systemic illness just from the mesh correct it yeah, was not something we learned in residency at all one yeah. thing i don't think it was ever mentioned once to me as a resident yeah never i would agree never and it, if, if it were, which was the breast implants were, it was poo-pooed as like a conspiracy theory. You know, like, well, it's it, real. It, it, it's silly to some degree. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree with that. I mean, at least in my world, it is. You know, I think- My world I, too, yeah. You know, for, for, every, for every article I, I've read, there's like, there's a um, rebuttal from someone who's like, that's a bunch of BS, you know, there's no proof. A few people doesn't think for everybody and you know this article is flawed well yes articles these articles may be flawed there i don't know that, that you know first of all i don't think you're ever going to be able to do a prospective blinded study with this type of thing in order to find out whether or not bii is real or or hernia mesh for that matter right one number two is how long do you want to wait to take care of people? I mean, you're going to wait another 10 years to take care of people I, before you decide, you know, you're going to wait for the studies before you start operating on people to, to help them? Yeah. I think that's nonsense. I, I was watching, this is going to seem like, like a, a, a red herring. I was watching uh, John Stewart has a new TV show on Apple TV. I heard. Uh-huh. So, and it's not it's not like the daily show it's not nearly as funny it's really it's really more doc, documentary yeah but his but his premiere episode was about um, about um, uh, burn pits in Afghanistan do you know what burn pits in Afghanistan are burn pits 
burn pits. So our, our fabulous military, who I love and I have an obsession with like special forces and everything, in Afghanistan and probably Iraq, in, in this modern Afghan war over the last 20 years, near every military base, they get rid of all their refuse by burning it. So they will, they will dig a burn pit adjacent to the base oh. and put everything in it. Used tires, clothes, amputated body parts, feces, food, trash, everything goes in the burn pit and they burn it. So like every week they're burning, there's black smoke, right? So all these oh. soldiers returning home are having these bizarre cancers, shocking, right? Like all these bizarre, at 30, 20, 30, and 40 years old, they're getting like the most bizarre respiratory illnesses and cancers and the VA system is denying it as not being service related because there's no studies to prove that it's service related, even though anecdotally, yes. anecdotally temporally it's related, right? Sound familiar? Yes, absolutely. So I'm like, like, what, <laughs> what what's everyone waiting for? I mean, I I understand the financial implications of it for a lot of people, but it, and, and there's always probably going to be a place for hernia mesh for some people, and there's always going to be a place for breast implants for some people, but not everyone sh should be getting it. Yeah, well, there was also the one, I think it was during the Iraq war where they had all the, the burnt, there, things were being burnt, like oil fields, but were being burnt. And so many of the American military were exposed and they came home with all these weird illnesses. Yeah. And they figured out it was all the, you know, I th on that note, my personal feeling is that we're doing something different now than we were doing 20 years ago that the mesh that we're selling now that we're putting into patients has a different chemical component and maybe more is like cheaper or maybe has more impurities in it than the one that was being made 20, 30 years ago. And maybe the same is true for breast implants that whatever the encasement of those implants is made of is a different, I mean maybe not as pure. What do you think about that? Maybe I'm not a biochemist. I really don't. I, I don't never gotten into the nitty gritty of how the shells are actually made and stamped and whatnot. Yeah, I, I suppose that's possible. I don't have any. I, I don't have any proof. I'm going to get, you know, lambasted by all the implant companies if I said that. I mean, I, I really don't know that. You know, the, the whole thing is that is that the, they're supposed to be better. I mean, the whole with each subsequent generation of silicone gel, it's it's better cross link, it's more cohesive. It, they're supposed to be less silicone bleed. They're supposed to be True. lower rupture risk, right? So- I will share with you a 60 minutes. Do you watch 60 minutes? If I can stay up, yeah. <laughs> It's seven o'clock at night, what do you mean? So- no, I tape it, I tape it. At seven o'clock at night, I'm like feeding my kids. <laughs> 60 minutes, I think 2016 did an expose on pelvic mesh and they showed exactly that, where they went from the FDA approved polypropylene resin to a cheaper China, Chinese based company that was making also polypropylene resin, but it wasn't equivalent. And it was not intended for human use. And they didn't tell the Chinese company, they bought it, they hid it from the FDA and they used it to make human grade pelvic mesh and all these poor women were having like brittle meshes and it was breaking and then causing these really massive reactions and autoimmune and inflammatory reactions and they got shut down but i mean it happens I, i'm sure it, i'm sure it happens and you but you would you would think that like these big reputable companies in the u.s would not go that route um, but uh, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of things that we don't know that happen in our government, in the FDA, at the CDC, right. which, which is why our country is so polarized right now on so many different levels. And that's why we have all these haters that call us quacks because we talk about this stuff. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, like I'm not injecting ivermectin in people who <laughs> Me. I'm just taking care of people who don't feel well, you know. <laughs> Call it what you want. <laughs> I, I will say this, I think China needs a new publicist because between COVID and now <laughs> these crap journey matches, <laughs> we're not doing very well. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, I always enjoy working with you. Thank you, thank you for taking care of my patients. We share many patients. You're actually removing an implant from a mutual patient of ours that... Um, well, hope, hopefully I'm removing both of them. Hopefully we're removing both of them and in efforts to maybe treat or improve an autoimmune disorder. So this stuff is real, it's every day and I really appreciate you sharing your time with us. As do I, you. Thank you so much. Thank happy, you. Happy to do this again. And so, have a great night. I will. And thanks. Go right. back to your I family. I appreciate your time on this. You need to not work so hard, Sharon. <laughs> I enjoy what I do is a problem. <laughs> right. um, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. So on that note, I'm going to say goodbye. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on Hernia Talk Live, our weekly Q&A on Tuesday. Tune in to my YouTube channel to make sure you watch, like, and share this hour, which I'm sure is going to be very helpful to more than just my audience. Um, thanks everyone on Facebook at Dr. Tofi and see you on next week. We have a lot more interesting guests coming up. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.